second panel, if you'll, uh, the gentleman would come forward. We're joined today by the seven members of the Loft uh, Hacker Think Tank in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, due to the sensitivity of the work done at the Loft, they'll be using their hacker names of Mudge, Weld, Brian Oblivion, Kingpin, Space Rogue, Tan, and Stefan. Gentlemen. <laughs> I, uh, I hope my grandkids don't ask me who my witnesses were today and <laughs> say Space Rogue. But we do, uh, we do understand your, uh, your need to do that. We appreciate your being with us. Uh, do you, uh, may I ask your name in the middle? Uh, I'm Mudge. You're Mudge. Mudge, would you like to make a statement? Yes, I would. Um, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, we think this is hopefully a very great step forward and uh, are thrilled that, that the government in general is, is starting to approach the hacker community. Um, we think there's a tremendous asset that the hackers actually bring to the table here in understanding. Um, my handle is Mudge. Uh, I and the six individuals seated before you, which will run down the line, Brian Oblivion. Uh, this is uh, John Tan, Kingpin. Uh, Weld Pond, Space Rogue, and Stefan Von Neumann uh, make up the hacker group known as The Loft. Uh, for the past four years, the seven of us has been touted as just about everything from uh, the hacker conglomerate, a hacker think tank, uh, the hangout place for the top U.S. hackers, uh, network security experts, and a consumer watch group. Uh, in reality, all we really are is just curious. For well over the past decade, the seven of us have independently learned and worked in the fields of satellite communications, uh, cryptography, operating system de design and implementation, computer and network security, uh, electronics and telecommunications. Throughout our learning process, uh, we've made a few waves with some large companies such as Microsoft, uh, IBM, Novell, and Sun Microsystems. At the same time, the top hackers and the uh, top legitimate cryptographers and computer security professionals pay us visits when they're in town. Uh, to, just to see what we're currently working on, so we, we kind of figure we must be doing something right. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, let the various members talk about a few of their previous projects, uh, their current projects, and what they're going to be working on in the future. Um, Weld? And if uh, okay. you've heard the testimony this morning, if there yes. are any points that in the process that you want to make uh, fairly briefly uh, mm -hmm. with regard to some of the previous questions or, or testimony, you can feel free to do that also. Definitely will. <coughs> Uh, good morning. My name is Weld Pond. I'm a hacker and programmer with over 10 years' experience um, working as a software developer in the so commercial software industry. Uh, my college training is as a computer engineer. At the Loft, I specialize in writing software programs for exploring computer network security and operating system security. Uh, my current projects include finding vulnerabilities in Microsoft Windows NT security. I'm actively working on Loftcrack, a program that we've created to exploit the weaknesses in Windows NT's password security, which uses cryptography to uh, secure the passwords, but we have found vulnerabilities in their implementation. Uh, this program has been extremely well received by military, government, and corporate security groups who use it to test their own passwords for weaknesses. Um, prior to the release of this program, um, Security experts claimed it would take thousands of years to uncover a um, Windows NT password, and we, our program can do it in uh, days and sometimes, in some cases, hours. Um, as a licensed amateur radio operator, I also enjoy radio communications. Um, a future project plan is collaborating with the Loft Hardware people to uh, create uh, secure public wireless networks, um, something that we're very interested in. Morning. My name is Kingpin. I am the youngest member of the Loft and one of the electrical engineers and hardware hackers. Uh, while some of the Loft members concentrate on software programming, I work with hardware design and implementation of electronic circuits. My interests include embedded system design, surveillance and counter surveillance tools, and wireless data transmissions. My current research project involves experimentation with the monitoring and eavesdropping of stray electromagnetic fields from computer terminals, otherwise known as Tempest Monitoring. Using low-cost electronic equipment, 
one can capture the contents of computer screens from more than 200 meters away, possibly gaining passwords and other sensitive information. The phenomenon of Tempest monitoring has been known to the industry for decades, but there is not much unclassified information available on how to both capture the emissions and also protect oneself from becoming an eavesdropping victim. My research will not only help me learn about the monitoring technology, it will enable me to educate others to help them protect their computer systems from prying eyes. My name is uh, John Tan. At uh, 28, I've been involved with computers, telecommunications, and security for 14 years now, the last eight of which have been spent in the financial services industry. Uh, my involvement with the loft has primarily been nondescript, but I've uh, achieved some notoriety uh, in terms of uh, documentation of some existing problems with uh, Novell Netware and a uh, compilation of uh, uh, my newly created uh, Palm Pilot document library. Uh, recently, I've consulted for various manufacturing, financial services, and uh, uh, management consulting firms regarding uh, information security policy and uh, how to establish a corporate security effort. Uh, I will continue uh, in the future to, pers to pursue an understanding of the, the risks of the information age and uh, communicate those findings to the government, the industry, and the media to provide a clear, consistent message of where we are and where we need to go. Good morning. I'm Space Rogue. Although my background contains no formal computer training, I have amassed a great deal of knowledge in computer security and the use of technology applications in the area of physical security. Currently, I'm working on assessing the vulnerabilities in various proximity detection devices, such as those used by EasyPass, Mobile Speed Pass, and controlled access cards. In conjunction with Stefan von Neumann, seated here today, and others in the hacking community, I'm acting seeking vulnerabilities in Apple Share IP by Apple Computer. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the members of this committee for inviting us here today. Good uh, my pen name is Brian Oblivion. My focus currently is microprocessor system design, satellite communications equipment, wireless communications architecture, and systems administration. Over the past few years, I have conducted research on the cellular networks, exploring the unencrypted data channels and their protocols explored uh, and explored the easily bypassed hardware-based non-cryptographic authentication used to track call expenses. Recently, I'm researching various digital decoding methodologies involving both dedicated hardware and software analysis via digital signal processing. This will result in the exposing of claimed secure wireless messaging and communication systems, and thus increasing the requirement of a more secure communications infrastructure. As an amateur radio operator, I am exploring authentication methods for amateur radio data networks. Uh, technology developed in this area, arena will be applied to commercial wireless networking products, uh, protocols and equipment that will utilize not only authentication, but encryption of the radio channel as well. The loss for me provides a much needed avenue for the dissemination of the present state of insecurity among various consumer networks and products. If it wasn't for groups such as ours and other motivated individuals in the security community, the state of awareness we have today would be years behind. Thank you. My name is Stefan von Neumann. I have been working with Loft since 1993, focusing primarily on high-power electronics, flaws in data networks, and the increasing convergence of power distribution and data distribution. My professional background includes supporting users on common computing products and networks, which gives me first-hand experience with how relatively unaware of computing risks most users are. Even worse, software publishers, internet providers, and utility companies are tight-lipped about flaws or risks inherent in products and services that touch the daily lives of most Americans. For example, in many areas of the country, including Boston area, Electric utility companies are using radio transmissions and or power lines to transmit data, meter data, from customers or, uh, customer locations. The same utility companies are also using such data transmissions for controlling their power systems. Even public water companies are using radio transmissions for controlling their water systems. In the same way that the so-called phantom controller was able to impersonate an airport control tower and issue instructions to a pilot, one could impersonate a legitimate utility company and disrupt water or electric service. 
Another example is internet data sent over cable television systems. Most customers of these services are not aware of the potential for another user to watch their private, quote unquote, communications across the cable TV network. And worse, the users are not aware of the possibility that an improperly configured computer could make available their data without their knowledge. I would personally like to see that the same type of independent review process that should exist for software companies extended to utility companies and internet service providers. Finally, customers and end users should be made aware of the risks. Thank you for having us here. Um, I'm one of the network system and cryptography wizards uh, at the loft. Basically, I'm the person who breaks into the systems uh, and undermines the network security, and that's what I do in my day job. Uh, <laughs> companies like that. Some of my previous projects were Loftcrack, along with WeldPond, uh, in which we developed the tool to, for showing administrators and users the insecurities of Microsoft's passwords. Uh, I've released several security advisories on various pieces of commercial software, which have uh, prompted vendor patches, which means they improved the software after we pointed it out to them. Uh, unfortunately, many times they would not improve the software until we actually went public with the findings. Uh, companies do indeed want to ignore problems as long as possible. Uh, it's cheaper for them. Um, recently, I conducted training courses at NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs to try and raise their level of awareness uh, as to the vulnerabilities, uh, especially with uh, the name brand recognition. Uh, in the very near future, I'll be conducting uh, training courses over at the NSA. Shortly after that, the Loft will be releasing a white paper on new cryptographic weaknesses that I, along with one of the top United States cryptographers, uh, have found in a very prominent commercial operating system, which will remain nameless. If you're, uh, if you're looking for computer security, then the Internet is not the place to be. Uh, if you think that you're an exception to the norm and that you have a secure setup that communicates over the Internet, uh, you're probably mistaken. Um, Furthermore, if you feel that the government is giving you access to the enabling technology you need to combat this problem, you're wrong yet again. Uh, the foundation of the Internet is over 20 years old at this point. While the technology still works, it's being asked to perform tasks that it was never intended to, uh, via secure fashions nonetheless. Uh, how can one be pr expected to protect a system on a network where any of the seven individuals seated before you can tear down the foundation that the network was built upon, let alone the systems that are sitting on top of it? So even if computers, systems, and other peripherals on the network were secure, the problem is still moot. Can the systems be secured? Well, in many cases, they actually can be. Uh, for instance, the problem with the phantom air traffic controllers could be remedied by incorporating relatively trivial and inexpensive cryptographically secure authentication. The same would hold true for MDC 4800, which is the protocol most commonly used by mobile police data terminals to remotely pull and update records. Personal paging protocols, uh, everybody has a little personal pager nowadays, uh, such as Poxag, Flex, and Golay, which the White House Communications Agency uses to coordinate movements of the president, would also benefit from this relatively trivial modification. Why don't strong authentication properties exist in these protocols? Most likely the same reason that simple security mechanisms are missing from all of the software, or almost all of the software, sold to cor corporations and agencies today. It's cheaper and it's easier for companies to sell insecure software. There's no liability attached to the manufacturers, and there's no policing done to stop companies from selling insecure software under the guise of secure. In an industry, industry where time to market matters, who wants or cares to add security or even thoroughly test their product? Well, you should. You, the government and consumer, should care and want software products to include security and authentication mechanisms, and I think you do. You should encourage the companies to include this in their products and hold them liable when their products fail. Uh, there are parts of the situ situation that the government can directly help. Lifting the constraints on cryptographic export would encourage companies to more readily include authentication and encryption in their products. The Cellular Telecommunications Protection Act is an example of legislation that is in place right now that hinders consumer watch groups such as ourselves, um, thus perpetuating the insecurity status quo that's out there. Yeah. Uh, in conclusion, hopefully you're having us here is not a fluke, and hopefully we've not offended in any way, uh, but this might be the beginning of an ongoing dialogue uh, between the government and the hacker groups such as ourselves. Uh, perhaps the information from such meetings will end up becoming an enabling mechanism for future change that will help organizations of all sizes, not just large government organizations. Uh, we encourage you to read the written testimony, uh, and we are more than happy to answer any questions in as much detail uh, or technical detail or 
non-technical detail uh, as you see fit uh, and expound or clarify upon any concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, you have not offended any of us, and, and uh, just the contrary, I think it's, it's probably uh, appropriate that gentlemen such as yourself are the ones who, who come forward and demonstrate that the emperor has no clothes. Uh, so we appreciate your coming here, especially in light of the fact that the Washington Post described you as rock stars of the computer hacking elite. Uh, so uh, we appreciate uh, your being with us here today. Um, I'm informed that you uh, think that it, within 30 minutes, the seven of you could uh, make the internet unusable for the entire nation. Is that correct? That's correct. Actually, one of us with just a few packets. Um, I we've we've told a few agencies about this. Uh, it's kind of funny because. We think that this is something that the various government agencies should be actively going after. We know the Department of Defense just did a very large uh, uh, investigation into what's known as denial of service attacks against the infrastructure. Uh, in our various day jobs, we contributed a large portion of the information to that uh, actual um, investigation. Uh, much to our chagrin, the learnings from it were instantly classified, uh, which we were giving them largely public information. Uh, it, it is very trivial with the old protocols to segregate and separate the different major long-haul providers, uh, which would then be the national access points, the metropolitan area ether uh, sections. AT&T can't talk to MCI, can't talk to PSINet, can't talk to Alternet, etc., etc., and keep it down that way as long as we really wanted to. It would definitely take a few days for people to figure out what was going on. You, uh, you state that, uh, that uh, with regard to, to commerce over the Internet, which is uh, rapidly growing, as we all know, that uh, the Internet was not designed for it. Well, what do you mean by that? Uh, the Internet was designed out of the uh, Defense Department's Advanced Research Project Agency to simply have computers talk to each other. Uh, this was a very laudable act and a laudable goal, and I think they succeeded fantastically. Uh, this was largely an academic environment uh, with some government research organizations. It grew up, it flourished, it, it struck everybody by surprise, and now big business is saying, well, let's, let's, um, let's jump on board and uh, make some money off of this. Well, you know, this, this is kind of like if you've driven in Boston, you know, the streets aren't tremendously designed in a wonderful fashion because they followed the cows around and laid the pavement down. I mean, you can get it to work, but it can be really painful, and that's the stage we're in right now. You say that you've been working with uh, some of our gov governmental agencies with regard to, to some of these problems. And, uh, of course, with commercial uh, entities. You know, it occurs to me in listening to you and, and listening to our prior witness that um, there doesn't seem to be an inducement for industry to do much about this at this stage of the game. That's what you're saying, essentially, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I hope that, uh, that there are some, some more forward-looking people in some of these industries than we've had in times past. You can look at uh, the automobile industry or the uh, tobacco industry or any number of industries uh, who have kept their heads in the sand or t chief executives about problems on the horizon. And uh, this is going to be something, as much as we dislike lawsuits, and there's too many of them, uh, in this country, this is clearly going to be something that is going to hit somebody big time one of these days before very long, and and uh, hopefully it won't uh, it won't take a, a, a economic um, disaster, you know, to cause all that. But you can see it on the horizon, can't you? I mean, they're going to have to come to terms with the fact that their ability to do something about this is out there, uh, and they're turning their back on a on a way to. Uh, uh, to make their systems more secure. They're not doing it. And they're going to be uh, clearly having to answer for that. You say that, that the Internet and comu computer security is almost non-existent. Could you elaborate on that a bit? What, what do you... You mean literally? Um, there, are, there are many aspects that make that up. Uh, the operating systems, as we just heard testimony from Dr. Neumann, 
uh, very correctly, uh, aren't incorporating any sort of real security mechanisms. There is a lack of education, and there is a lack of understanding as to what the problems are out there. Uh, there, is, there are no mechanisms for uh, places to keep, their, uh, keep abreast of current findings. I mean, the security realm and the network security uh, in particular is very rapidly changing. Uh, so it's kind of difficult. It's not like, what was the analogy with the, the cars? Somebody give a, the recall? They send you a, a letter if, if your Ford Explorer is going to have a very serious problem. Um, the number of operating systems out there, uh, they aren't sending people the letters. They're saying, you have to do your own due diligence and come to us and find out what we've made publicly available or what we've decided to uh, alert you to. At the same time, um, keep in mind that uh, if we don't alert you to it, uh, we save a lot of money and we save our top engineers times by not having to throw them at the products where they can add new bells and whistles into whatever. Uh, Let me just add something to that. Yeah, please. Yeah. Mark, the, the analogy was that the uh, Volkswagen Beetle that just got recalled, evidently they found three cars that had a problem, three. Um, and they didn't cause any serious deaths or injuries, but they just found three potential problems in the vehicle. They sent out 8,500 letters to every purchaser of the vehicle in the United States. Um, if, there, if there's a software company that has three hack attempts against it, or three successful hack attempts against it, uh, a particular piece of software or an operating system, they're not going to go call every single one of their people that just spent you know, a lot of money buying their software, telling them, hey, there's a problem, we need to call back our software so we can fix it. That, right now, that doesn't happen. Um, some of the problems that are found are reported to the manufacturers, and they don't even make a fix publicly available. They work on a fix internally, and if you have the same problem and you come to them and you say, you know, I'm getting broken into, someone's attacking my system in this way, they'll say, okay, well, we have this behind-the-scenes fix that you can apply to your system, but we haven't even made it publicly available yet. And until the problem mushrooms up and enough people complain about it, then they'll come out with a public fix. But if it's behind the scenes, people just contacting the manufacturer, we've seen that they don't really come public and uh, even tell the other users of their system that this problem exists and here's the fix for it. Uh, this, uh, one thing real quickly before. This is one of the main problems with the computer emergency response team. Right. Uh, there's also a lot of finger pointing in the industry where the systems administrators claim that the uh, software provided them isn't shipped in a secure manner. The uh, industry says that they're they shouldn't be responsible for that. And I'm not quite sure, because I'm not a lawyer or even in nearly skilled in political matters, but I don't know if there's any legislation that could, could fix the uh, liability problem. I, I don't know. But I, I know that is one of the issues out there. I just want to add one thing to that, is that um, in, in the point of liability, the, the car manufacturers will be, in our head, liable if something goes wrong in their product. If, if something's wrong in one of the 10,000 cars and, and it explodes, uh, they will be held liable. If, if something breaks in the software, the companies aren't held liable and, and they feel why, you know, why do they have to tell people they're, they're not responsible? Um, just, just another uh, sort of liability analogy which we found, which sort of makes sense, is um, kryptonite, kryptonite makes uh, bicycle locks. and. Uh, they say, our lock is so good, if your bike is stolen, it's a $30, $40 lock. If, if, if your bike is stolen, we'll pay up to $1,000 to uh, replace your bicycle. So basically, they're saying our security works and we'll, 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 we'll stand behind it. Software vendors do not stand behind their security. They say, well, if it's broken and there's enough problems, maybe we'll fix it. But if you lose thousands of dollars, say you have an e-commerce site up on the internet and your whole business is built around their software, which they've told you is secure, they've told you, oh, we've added all these great features and you can run your business on our software. And then your business fails because of their, they caused your business to fail essentially if it's e-commerce. If your site's down, you're not making money. They say, sorry. One of, one of the things about the kryptonite locks is they're not unbreakable and they're not unpickable. And the company knows that, but they've raised the bar. They've raised it enough that the ankle biters, uh, the novices, you know, will go to the next bike that's unlocked. The same thing with car alarms. You get a discount on your insurance for doing, performing due diligence. You just raise the bar and you get, a, get away from the noise level. Uh, thank you very much. I have one more question. <clears throat> I know the other members uh, have questions. Uh, part of what you're trying to do is demonstrate something that you feel like the American people need to know, and that's part of our job also. And I'm, I'm curious, if a foreign government 
was able to assemble a group of gentlemen such as yourself um, and paid them large amounts of money and got them in here or hired them here to wreak as much havoc on this government as they could in terms of infrastructure, the governmental operations, whatever. Um, how much damage could they do? We'd be in trouble. Um, in that scenario, go ahead. Um, Just give me some. We, give, yeah, we give, we give had some idea of what we're talking about. We had some of uh, some of your aides up to talk to us and suss us out at the beginning, and I think they were relatively impressed with uh, what we've managed to put together without any funding whatsoever. Um, Brian, do you want to talk about some of the satellite communications, or I mean, let alone just taking us down from the financial? Aspect. There's there's so many different ways that that well, each of you have, have it a, could be have a comment on that. Just relate it, please. You can run down the line. <laughs> okay. Uh, regarding satellite communications, um, you could oh, if you were highly paid enough, uh, you could assemble jamming gear to temporarily knock out uh, uplinks. Um, you could uh, take an area. I'm sure you're, you're aware of like the HERF guns and the EMP blasts and typical informational warfare. It's more on the physical level rather than just the information uh, security um, where you would be able to uh, disable equipment by generating a high energy pulse, uh, disabling the, co the clock, which controls everything in the uh, computer system to what malfunction. Would what would it, be the effect it would of that? Like, well, it depends on the equipment. It would be, you could do it to a telephone switch or a uh, generally, um, uh, national access points for the internet are in unshielded buildings. Uh, sometimes they're in just regular commercial buildings without any type of so electromagnetic what be, what protection. Would be, what would be the effect of that? How would we feel that? You would feel that by an instant uh, disruption. disruption of internet service on that point, now, including... What's, what's, another, what's another area? Sure. Sure. Um, we'll let Kingpin talk about Tempest. Some of the areas that you should worry about are your phone systems are down, your electricity is gone, um, your yep, financial markets. Uh, we recently uh, had a very close call in the financial markets. Um, the uh, disruption of service is a wonderful way of messing people up. Uh, in addition, by disrupting surf uh, service in certain patterns, you can force people to take other routes. Uh, let's say that I have taken over MCI's networks, uh, which would not be a tremendously difficult thing to do. I mean, you ha most people can get access to the metropolitan area ethers and the national access points, physical access even. Uh, so I, I can watch everything that goes through this major backbone provider's uh, transitory networks, but I can't watch Sprint. Well, what am I going to do? I'll disrupt Sprint service so that everybody routes through me. Now I can learn everything you're doing. I can watch your movements. I can stop your movements. I can issue requests on your behalf. Um, I mean, you'd be surprised how much stuff is tied into the, to the general networks now. Uh, I think if a nation state uh, funded a group of people to uh, attack the United States electronically, the number of systems that can be disrupted or compromised is, is so great that it would probably wreak a lot of havoc in the country. Whether or not the country can recover from that in a, an adequate period of time um, or defend against it is, is, a, is a good question. But there's definitely some potential there for uh, abuse. Also, as I uh, mentioned in my initial statement about uh, Tempest monitoring, which will allow outsiders or insiders to receive uh, emissions from from computer terminals, um, one one can see the screens of people's. Uh, they could read read the email safe off the screen, or maybe if they're accessing some confidential system, um, or looking up some kind of criminal records or something like that. Um, and the outsider or insider or intruder could <laughs> then become familiar with the system and access it in a different way. Well, what would you do with the mobile data terminal stuff? Uh, with the mobile data terminal, um, the same type of thing can happen. You can either intercept uh, the data via, via just wireless transmissions, or you can monitor the terminals with Tempest uh, technology. And by just monitoring the transmissions, you can uh, view what the police are transmitting and receiving about criminals or, or internal government agencies or, or something. Oh, um, thank you very much, Senator Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I had to 
Well, you, you, know, you have fictitious names here, but I think I had the pleasure of talking to a couple of you gentlemen uh, some three or four years ago in a different venue, and uh, that was a fascinating conversation, and this is fascinating this morning. I'm, I'm not quite clear. Now, does the loft uh, do this on a business basis now, too, or are you just amateurs that uh, get together and, and are, are doing this uh, because, as it says in your testimony here, uh, uh, space live while at the same time continuing a premise for what they do. What you do is to have fun, pushing the envelope, examining security systems, providing full disclosure to all those in the security industry of our findings. Is a strictly an amateur group, or are you available for hire from people that want to uh, have, uh, avail themselves of your expertise? Um, we have been a strictly amateur group for a long time. It's uh, very monetarily taxing for us. So we all once have day jobs, I guess. Yes, we all have day jobs, and this all comes out of our own pockets uh, for all the equipment that we try and salvage together and the different projects we want to learn about. Um, we do, uh, when the purse strings become very tight, uh, go out and uh, take consulting jobs or uh, do different consulting work. To We'd be more than happy to, to, you know, come help people out. Unfortunately, a lot of people are scared to come talk to us. We have to end up, we end up beating people over the head publicly in order to get them to even fix their problems, which doesn't endear us with them tremendously. Yeah. Let me expand the, the uh, area of vulnerability just a little bit here and get your comments on this. Uh, I was thinking of communication satellites here and talking about that. Uh, can you get into the, uh, the command structure, the command signals that go up to position those satellites? Could you relocate them and then foul up the whole system, not by destroying them or not by fouling up the computers necessarily, but taking them out of their positions? Actually, um, uh, uh, companies like ComSat and other uh, telemetry command and control systems are using authentication for their command structure, which is what we would recommend to other um, more commercial, well, actually, to just to other uh, areas of wireless um, telemetry con and control uh, that would increase the bar of the uh, state of security of radio controlled telemetry systems. About our GPS system, is it, uh, is it vulnerable also? That we're going global positioning system. We're, we're going to be relying a lot more on that. We're relying on that for some of our weapon systems that used to be highly classified. Now there's been a lot of writing about it. Um, we're, we're using that to, to a, a tremendously increased degree these days for our military and for commercial aviation and everything else. I, I have a little Magellan handheld I use in my little airplane flying back and forth, and it, it's great. One of the problems with GPS is it's a very weak signal. Um, it's very easy to jam that signal. As a matter of fact, there was a, uh, an incident a few months ago in upstate New York where a test was being conducted by the Air Force the test, unbeknownst to the Air Force personnel, was interfering with the GPS signals to aircraft landing in New Jersey. Um, luckily, it was during the daytime, and the aircraft was trying to rely on the GPS signals uh, to land, um, but they lost their GPS. Uh, so they went on uh, manual and landed that way. If somebody wanted to, though, could they get into the GPS system and actually relocate some of those satellites slightly, which would throw off all that and screw up all your information that you're getting? Is that possible? Um, uh, traditionally, the military has been very good about um, authentication methods on telemetry and command and control systems. So I, I, I think you'd be more uh, worried about um, setting up a uh, you know, 2.x gigahertz uh, jammer rather than somebody actually moving the satellites around or colliding them or, you know. You jam it and relocate it because yeah. of weak signal. Right. Yeah. Or it could be hidden One in. One comment here. On uh, August 21st, I believe it is, 1999, a lot of the receivers will fail. They have a uh, year 2000 type problem where they mm -hmm. run out of bits and it resets to January 1980. Just thought I'd toss that one in. I mean, I'm going to have to go, but don't, don't be flying that day if I want to go where I'm supposed to be going, is what you're telling me. All right, I'll, I'll check that one out. Uh, how about could you get in and transfer Federal Reserve funds to uh, someplace? If just, about, just about everything is possible. It depends on how much money you want to throw at it, yeah. time and effort. Uh, from the amount of time and effort and the money, which is non existent uh, for us, uh, and the fact that, you know, we like not being in jail, uh, we'd say, no, we wouldn't. Do that if we really wanted to and really had to, okay. yes. Because if you make it easy enough for yourself or somebody else to use it, you make it vulnerable. I, I, I look at you guys as the white hats in this whole thing. Yeah, I think your, your motivation, as far as I know, is excellent. I think you want to be considered that way. But let's say we have a bunch of bad guys now. Can you, can you with your expertise, 
track back and find out who the bad guys are if they're trying to foul up GPS or Federal Reserve or something else. Can you, can you track that back and locate the, the uh, people that are not of goodwill? Backtracking and um, reverse hacking uh, is a relatively tricky area. Um, based upon the, the relatively antiquated protocols that you're dealing with, there's not a tremendous amount of information as to where things came from, just that they came. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, giving confessional to a priest. You have this big blind in between you, and you're just hoping and trusting that the person's actually there listening to you and that they can do anything about it. Getting a letter with no return address and nothing inside. You receive something, but there's no way to know where it came from. Yeah, okay. That's what I was afraid of. Uh, Mr. Newman is still here, and I think uh, his answer, it, it, when I asked us about is a secure system possible that could not be hacked into, I believe his answer was he didn't think so. Do you gentlemen agree with that? Do you think there, there is a system can be designed that would be foolproof that we could use for defense and for uh, key elements such as the Northeast Grid or our financial, uh, the Federal Reserve, or whatever? Is it possible to design a foolproof system? I don't, think it's, I don't think it's possible to design a foolproof system, but I don't think that should be the goal. The goal should be to d make it very difficult to get in. Um, the more difficult you make it, the less risk that you uh, assume uh, from something, a foreign nation state or a teenage kid from breaking into that system. So the, the goal is to raise the bar uh, and then have a plan to reconstitute after that effect if it does happen. Can you, in effect, and I, uh, Mr. Newman, I think maybe you, uh, you, uh, you're in power distribution, I believe was said, and so on. Can you blow a computer? Can you, can you overpower it? Can you put enough material in and just blow it? You don't need to worry about uh, getting the material off or fouling up. You can just put it in and blow the computer. There's can you do that? Not so much an issue of blowing a computer, destroying it over a power line. I mean, there's, there's HERF, high energy uh, radio frequency, there's EMP that can do that from, uh, from means other than over a power line. Um, maybe more of a concern would be interruption of power. We were, in, in the course of uh, one, of our, one of our investigations, um, able, to, um, able to use a power interruption uh, that, that was nothing to do with us. It happened to be a coincidental power interruption, but to our benefit that a power interruption that was a deliberate okay. could be. I wasn't thinking so much of, of uh, overpowering with so many high power electric currents coming in. I was thinking of uh, getting in and fouling up circuits in such a way that it'll dump its programming and things like that. Can you do that? Yes, yes. Um, Mudge, care to talk about buffer overflow? Uh, well, I think what maybe they're talking a bit more about is bit shifting and um, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of improvement uh, in actual analysis of cryptographic protocols by bombarding with um, x-rays to actual, actually flip bits inside. Um, the, the trick is to be able to control this little black box and watch the information you're sending in and the information that you're getting out from it uh, as you change its innards, even if you don't necessarily know what you're changing uh, precisely. Uh, buffer overflows are an extremely common uh, coding problem. The, many of the problems that are out there that, that contribute to this lack of security are, are extremely simple. Uh, buffer overflows are spottable in source code by a first-year college um, computer programmer, uh, by people without any uh, college uh, computer programming skills. Uh, the notion of um, race conditions, where there is a certain amount of time between what I tell you uh, something in between what you tell uh, another senator that I could go in and change that information. Uh, so uh, the Senator Lieberman believes that you said something else. Uh, these are all very straightforward problems. They, they weren't addressed because computers really came out of uh, a tremendous amount of uh, fun and joy and research and exploration. They didn't think about the commercial ramifications uh, and aspects. Uh, probably didn't answer the question at all there. <laughs> 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 you, <laughs> you may want to run for public office one of these days. <laughs> uh, uh, now I blew my whole train of thought here. <laughs> oh, I know what it was. Uh, we alluded this a while ago when Mr. Newman was here about uh, would it be possible to set up a whole different system for defense, uh, for intelligence matters, for uh, CIA, for NSA, for uh, uh, people doing very highly classified work that we don't want out. Would there be an advantage to us uh, funding and setting up a whole separate system? And how long would it be invulnerable if, if we did such a thing? Or uh, is it worth the effort? It'd be very expensive to do it. Uh, how would we, would it be worth doing? 
Um, one of the things that was said earlier was there are no easy answers. Um, maybe not any uh, answers at all, but what I believe is it's there are answers, they're just quite painful. Um, yes, I think that is one of the ways to do it. Several of the agencies uh, within the government currently do that. It is very expensive. If you have extremely sensitive information, you do not trust it with other networks that are less sensitive, that are less trusted. Um, the actual computer systems can be made to be relatively secure, the physical hardware in it. Uh, it becomes very costly. It's, it's a cost-benefit you know, analysis that you end up doing here. The software can be improved upon. The software doesn't have to be fantastic. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is, is there's a tremendous amount um, of, of interest in the year 2000 problem. And I, every time I hear it, I have to sit back and, and I chuckle to myself because we're worried about the year 2000 when these systems crash, but they're crashing left and right right now and nobody cares. Uh, the, the systems, you can, you can work with them right now. They do crash. I mean, how many times has anybody in here run Windows and had to reboot it or a Macintosh? I mean, left and right. They still work. If you put them in a secluded room, put a guy with a gun next to it, and don't let it talk to other systems, it's relatively secure. I'm not quite sure what we do if we require the, the uh, computer industry to, to uh, do something. You say that there are no incentives for industry to do much. I'm not quite sure what they do. This is like uh, uh, some people may want to buy the equivalent of a Model T Ford. They buy a tiny car. Other, other people want to buy more security, and, and uh, uh, so they buy a great big or a lot of people go into vans now because they're bigger and heavier and show less fatalities in an accident, things like that. You're going to have different levels that people want. Uh, to go out. How, how would you go about uh, the computer industry? What would you require them to do that would make this program better? Or would it just be making government agencies and people know that if they're going to go to certain types of information or banks or the Fed or whatever, that they have to buy a, a computer that is upgraded to a certain level and we should be much more cognizant of these security levels when you purchase a, secure, uh, a, a computer than ever before? Uh, that's sort of a convoluted statement, but you know what I... I'm driving it, I think. Uh, how, do we, how do we regulate this? I'm not sure we could. Well, actually, in the industry now, um, Microsoft sort of does the Model T in another car example. They have Windows, which is sort of the Model T. That's for your individual user at home. And then they have Windows NT, which is a more secure system. The problem is it's just more secure. doesn't mean it is, is really good enough for doing, doing what, we, what you'd say is a secure system that's good enough. And... Um, the, the problem is they, you know, we, we get back to they have no liability and they just say, oh, uh, you know, it doesn't work, sorry, we'll, we'll fix it in the next release. Um, they don't have any way of telling you, the customer, or no one really does that I know of, what, what they did to make this, the system secure. You can't say, show me your security architecture, show me um, your, your development process that went through and, and looked for the problems, and, and show me that uh, the system is secure. No, no one's doing that. No one's really uh, selling a commercial product that does that, can assure you, the buyer, that you are buying the, the Cadillac with the, uh, the bulletproof glass. So no one's really selling that, and no one's really assuring anyone that that, that that's true. It comes down to Microsoft just saying, trust us, um, and there's really no way to test the product to find out if, in fact, it is secure, at least by the end user or the consumer. Um, so it, unlike the, the catalog with the bulletproof glass, you can go up and you can look at the glass and see how thick it is. You can't do that with software. I'm sure my time is more than enough. We don't have lights here, but I, uh, just one more question here. It would seem to me maybe uh, all of our concern, and, and maybe this overstates it, but our concern about whether people get in and have access or can manipulate a system where it transfers something to another spot or something, maybe this isn't uh, our biggest danger. Maybe it's uh, Stefan's thing over here where you just get in. If you really want to do harm to our country, you just get in, in effect, blow the computer or, or do the transfers, as you said about by x-ray or whatever it is, and you've fouled up the whole thing irretrievably. Uh, rather than going in and trying to manipulate a system. Is that a, should our biggest worry be in this area? And it would seem to me that that might be something that would be easier to protect against than all this getting in and, and fouling up somebody's specific software program. Is that, uh, am I over-optimistic? It's much simpler for someone to perform a denial of service than it is to 
change the data and insert their own or to um, uh, or to manipulate. Um, it would not be surreptitious. The, you'd, you'd know it when it happened, that's yeah, for sure. You exactly. Wouldn't. Much, much less expensive to do that kind of uh, damage and much simpler. Um, easier to prevent against, perhaps, and perhaps more straightforward in the short term to harden the, uh, the, the major network access points and, and it, uh, to, the, to the extent of a uh, military facility, um, temp making more tempest-proof uh, facilities. Uh, or x-ray-proof shielding, something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, yeah, that, that may, be, may be simpler in the short term. There is um, documentation on that, uh, and it is possible to shut down machines with the high-energy yeah. uh, RF. Um, protecting against it has, has been done. Um, it is done, and it's fairly simple. You can basically enclose, enclose something in, in a giant metal box, um, which will prevent the, out, you know, the outside uh, RF. Um, I don't know if that's done a lot inside the government. Some of the military uh, computers need to be tempest proof. Uh, Brian, you were going to say something there. Oh, uh, I think I was just going to say that the box needs to be grounded. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> but, uh, if I may, um, I, I think it should be grounded, yeah. Thank you. One of the things uh, I think is coming out here is uh, got to do with the, uh, it, it's not just the encryption, the strong encryption, it's not just the, uh, the network or the operating system, it's, it's all these things that have to be applied across the board um, in order for one person to actually have enough uh, responsibility to be able to um, tackle the problem themselves. They have to um, be, be in an environment where there are others, in, not only in their own industry, but in other industries that are trying to uh, raise that bar. So as a whole, the uh, the security goes up. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, Senator Thompson indicated that somebody had referred to you as rock stars of the new computer age. Uh, it's probably not uh, what what you came to hear, but I, I actually I think you're performing a, an act of very good citizenship. And um, I appreciate it. I'd compare you, I hope you don't mind that I'm not going to call you rock stars, I'd compare you more to uh, Rachel Carson, who sounded some early warnings about uh, what environmental pollution was doing to the environment. And, and in the defense context, you may be modern day Paul Revere's, except in this case, it's not the British coming. Uh, we don't know who's coming, that's the problem. I mean. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the chairman's question before was chilling. I mean, you you are obviously very bright and very uh, very creative, and work at this. But if there's anything we have learned at the modern age is that you don't um, you you cannot particularly in this age, particularly because of computers, where knowledge and information travels so quickly. Uh, just as you have been able to do this at Loft, there, there could be, there are people all around the world who are able to do this, and they may not be good citizens. Uh, they may be up for hire to people who don't wish us well. So I appreciate what you're doing, and I, I must say in this regard that it may be that the appropriate metaphor here is not Chernobyl, but uh, unfortunately Oklahoma City, where if we looked at it, we would have understood, and some did, that there was real vulnerability. Uh, but we didn't do anything about it. And uh, I think that's what you're telling us, and I, I hope we can continue to work with you to try to raise our guard. I think the other thing you've, you've helped me to understand and it, uh, is that there is no such thing as absolute security. Nothing, no system is foolproof. I think what you said is that the aim here should be to make it more difficult to uh, break a system, to infiltrate it. Uh, of course, there never has been absolute security. I suppose it's just that the consequences of insecurity in an age in which we are also reliant on computers are more, uh, more consequential. They're, they're more massive. They're more widespread. Let me ask you a, a couple of questions following up on that theme of, of uh, accepting that there's no, not, no system that's foolproof. You've, you've said here in your testimony that uh, you given 30 minutes, uh, you might be able to uh, render the internet unusable. Uh, not forever, obviously, but for some, some period of time. What, uh, what can we do? What, what can the system do? What can the government do? What can private uh, uh, folks do to try to protect against that? The, um, 
the one the one uh, method of doing that that we were referencing uh, there there are several there are dozens of them actually but uh, this is a, a, a good uh, example you can prevent and you can stop uh, that particular attack from happening however uh, the nature of of the internet and the companies that are providing the long-haul uh, backbone connections of it is to move the information as quickly as possible across that because that's money every packet millions of packets go by a second is worth a little bit of money if you even stop to look at the packets you have to send slightly less than your maximum capacity might be in which case your competitor uh, now has an edge on you because they can offer faster more efficient service so in order to protect yourself you very slightly uh, you know one millisecond uh, per packet uh, degrade service but that definitely cascades into a noticeable um, financial hit which the companies aren't willing to take uh, so they um, remain vulnerable. So let me uh, just uh, compare things and go to you, uh, Stefan von Neumann, because you, you talked about your work in utility systems. And um, let me ask you just to compare, for instance, today, uh, leaving aside what we've talked about, or let's, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, somebody who wanted to do damage to a utility system could uh, cut wires, could if they were um, more aggressive, uh, you know, blow up a power station, a substation. So compare that, the effects of something more primitive like that uh, from somebody with hostile intent to the possibility, possibilities that you envision in the new world. It could be, it could be more well-timed or more, um, more specific of an impact. I mean, where, where the, 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 the detonation of an explosive near a substation could take down an entire grid with specific computer control of, of an area. You might be able to interrupt only one customer's service, say if there was a, a commercial entity that was a target. That one, that one commercial entity or that one government building could become um, denied of electric service or water service or the, uh, whatever the, the utility service was that was going to benefit the attacker. So Computer, computer service. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So, so the, in the past where it simply was just a, a destruction, it might not have had the, the, the specific focus on the, the, on the attack point, where now it, it, it allows that. I, I think another issue is if somebody goes out and cuts a line, there's a plan in place. We send out a repairman, he fixes the line, you're all set. Right. You blow up the building, you rebuild it. If we attack the computer systems, how do we constitute that? Right. There are no plans in place right, right now and to, to recover from that. And there, there may be um, no way to anticipate the follow-up. I mean, if, if there's an attack made, a physical attack, an explosion against, or, or a line cutting, then there could be increased security in that area on those same facilities, so right. that the same thing wouldn't happen again. If it's, an, if it's a computer issue, I mean, the, the attacker could be sufficiently skilled that they could simply change their method slightly and go around any defense that's put up in the place of the first, of the first attack. And uh, the, the ability to find the attacker it would, it would be compromised. And it would be harder to find the attacker. Simply because of the, the, the nature of, of, of the Internet as it is, with yeah. the, the, the no authentication, no proof of, of where you are, who in you are. In your line-cutting analogy, uh, the guy goes out and snips a, the wire, uh, maybe somebody saw him, we can track him through a witness. If he comes in over the Internet and attacks our computer systems, we don't know where it came from and nobody saw him. Exactly. Mm -hmm. final, uh, final question. Somebody used the VW example. And it's an interesting one. You know, as you said, um, three cars show some sign of the impact of the wiring defect. They recall all 8,500 of the new Beetles that they've sold in the U.S. And, and, it, and as you said correctly, as far as I know, the, uh, you know, th three indications of hacking into a system and nobody's under an obligation to do it. I, I haven't looked at this in a while, but the, the, um, the automobile companies and the recalls are not motivated simply by, if I may overuse the term here, good citizenship. There's law. And there is the the fear of liability. Um, so it is, and this is a complicated area. And as Dr. Neumann said, we've got to be real careful not to jump too quickly without thinking about it. But is there a way in which we should be setting some standards here? I mean, for instance, a very simplistic standard would be to require uh, systems operators or, uh, or, or, or service providers or manufacturers to um, 
to, to give public notice of instances of hacking, successful hacking into a system. Or, or at least public notice of vulnerabilities that they've found in their system. This is definitely a double-edged sword because when you give the information out, right. um, other people can figure out how to exploit it. Yeah. Um, however, if you don't give the information out, the people out there can't protect themselves. Uh, I think we've tried it the route where we have kept the information secret. Um, the computer emergency response team out of Carnegie Mellon uh, does that. I think, and I, I know a whole bunch of people in the computer, computer industry uh, agree with me on this, that they have become more detrimental than beneficial by a long shot. A um, <laughs> couple words of encouragement from right behind me. Uh, full disclosure is very important. I mean, you have to educate people. Education is one of the largest things that's really missing um, out of this. If I'm an administrator, and there's a problem in what I have to control, but the companies don't let me know about it, I can't be expected to fix it. Even if the companies don't have a fix themselves, if I know of the problem, I might be able to put other things in place in front of it so I can catch it. Right. I might have different, a different setup. Not everybody has the exact same setup. You might disconnect your system from the network. Yeah, I might say, hey, that's really bad. I need to get off of there right now. Mm -hmm. But I'd be able to do that. And, uh, I'll go, I'll go one further, not, not only to point out the flaws, but also to point out the inner workings. I, um, this may be uh, rehashing something that's, that's well known, but the Unix environment being around for so many years, being public, being able to be examined, has most of the fixes quite well known. Microsoft Windows NT, all of their code is completely hidden from public eyes. They don't release it. It's, as, as it's been said, a black box. So the public, even if even if end user wanted to go and look inside the internals of, say, Windows, Windows NT, they're not allowed to. It's illegal, according to the software licensing put forth by Microsoft, to disassemble, to try and reverse engineer it. That kind of a limitation is, is just putting the brakes on investigation of, of the flaws. Like open the hood. Exactly. Amen. It's a good, good, uh, good comparison to close on. I, I want to thank you again. Um, this is another classic example of what we we find very often w on this side <laughs> as lawmakers, which is that we see a problem, we 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 want to we want to make it better. We contemplate law, but we but this is in an area of very developed expertise, which most of us don't have. So we rely, well, we often rely on science and data and on the people who have more expertise and then try to make the best judgment we can. I, 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 in, in thanking you, I really want to, uh, although I know, you're, you know you've already got two, you got a day job and a night avocation, but um, to the extent that you find time, I really uh, ask you, request that you think about what the government, what we as lawmakers, if anything, I mean, it may be that you're going to come back and say, you're only going to mess it up here. Um, what we, what, what we might do through law to deal with some of the, to protect ourselves from some of the vulnerabilities that uh, you've identified. Thank, thanks very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much for, for being here with us today. I, like Senator Lieberman, think that you are performing a, a valuable service to your country. And, and we appreciate that, uh, and, and want you to continue, and want you to, to continue to help us. I think the liability question is a very good one. I, I wonder, for example, whether or not it's a matter of laws, whether or not there are already laws under the common law, under, under state laws, uh, the, the law of uh, general tort law of negligence and fraud and uniform, uh, uniform commercial code and all those things. The first time some big company uh, has been compromised because of this. That, that It may fix itself because there will be a massive lawsuit and uh, everybody will wonder why we didn't address this uh, um, in the beginning. But um, they're fascinating, fascinating issues. And, uh, you know, you've pointed out that our computer security is, is, is virtually uh, uh, non-existent and how easy it is to obtain sensitive information and, and uh, shut down valuable... Uh, governmental operations, uh, uh, and um, we're going to have to do something about it. It's that simple. 